He's an interior guy, so he's going to tell us whatever they have here. I'm also with you. If there's any question, uh, we can ask him and I'll be able to help him uh, for you to understand where you are standing now. Thank you so much. Fanny, yes, this is uh, Africa for the Africans. And uh, every year we come to this place, uh, twice a year, May and then December. And uh, today we are here to see what you have here and what you tell us. So we are in your hands now. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Agu. Amen. Agu. Amen. All right, like we rightfully said, uh, my name is Kwame, but I have another name added to Kwame Divine. Divine? Yes, ma'am, Divine. So Kwame Hui is divine there. So that's who I am. My name is Kwame because I was born on a Saturday. And just like all Africans or all Ghanaians, immediately you are born on a particular day, you inherit a name. But our ancestors didn't get to take theirs along because of the way things happened. So I'm going to be a side guy here at the Asimansu slave market and the riverside where most of our ancestors passed through and were sold to their various merchants or slave masters. Before we start, in their memories, during that time a lot of our ancestors died. From the hinterlands walking to get to this place, from here to the dungeons at Cape Coast, through the middle passage several of our ancestors died. On the plantations, you could attest to it, that so many of our ancestors had to sacrifice their lives for their brothers and sisters to survive, so that you will be a product of these survivors. If that's not going to be a problem, I want us to have a minute of silence in their memories. After that, I will say may their souls rest in perfect peace and we all could respond by saying Ashe. So please, let's have a minute of silence. May the brave spirits of our lost ancestors rest in perfect peace. Ashe. Ashe. Once again, I welcome you by saying a call back to the Asimans to slave market and the riverside. Yes. I'll be starting, but I don't normally start my talks without giving these particular quotes. So I'm going to give it to you as well. One from Haile Selassie, and I quote, An awareness of our past is essential to the establishment of our personalities and our identities as Africans. Marcos Mezea Gavi Jr. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our own minds. On this continent, among the people of Togo, Benin, and Ghana, we have this popular saying that goes by, until the tales of the hunt is told by the lions, the hunt will always glorify the hunters. Why do I fancy all these quotes? Because I find it talking to me as an African. My African ancestors were held captives in chains and shackles, moved away from their own land. After slave trade came to an end, we as Africans who survived didn't get to tell our stories. The story is being told to us by the same people who enslaved our ancestors. I always ask myself, have they told us exactly what they came here to do? Or they told us what we needed to hear in our ears? It has always been what they wanted us to hear. His story. Their story. Yes. Yes. His story. Yes. His story. yes. So they've told us what they wanted us to hear so that it wouldn't put us ahead of them. Our ancestors couldn't have gone through this, or we, let me use the word well. For us, the newer generations, mm -hmm. perhaps we couldn't have make, made it to the other side. They were stronger than we are. 
so they made it so that we will be here today. After slave trade came to an end, our ancestors didn't even have their own local languages, their tongues. The Akan words, the uh, African, the Swahilis, and the Swazis, nothing. They lost all those things to the chains and shackles. They claim to be telling us the stories, and these stories are not being told to us for us to acknowledge the fact that we are Africans. They are telling us all this so that we wouldn't be able to come back home. <laughs> so Haile Selassie had to come here to encourage us that we as Africans need to learn about our past. And that past will enlighten us, will open our eyes so that we can use that to establish our personalities and our identities. Emancipating one's mind is a huge deal for Africans. We've been kept out there for a very long time. Mostly what they show about Africa is not something that is encouraging for you to visit the land. But several times, when you are coming, you meet all these white folks at the airports. <laughs> Today, when you get to the airport, you see them in numbers. Why are they coming to Africa or why are they coming to Ghana? They knew exactly why they are coming. The same thing that belongs to us, they are coming here to get it and take it away and utilize it for their own selfish gains. So they are preventing us from coming here to get exactly what we so rightfully deserve. before our ancestors left the coast of Africa. Deep inside their hearts, they told themselves that we are coming back home one day. They hoped to return, but coming back home happened to be just a hope. The ship that took them out of this continent doesn't belong to them, it belonged to their masters. And after slave trade came to an end, and then those who survived, they couldn't return back home, but they needed to survive so that you, the newer generations, the generations of today, will come back home with their spirits. So I always say that you are here on behalf of your bloodline and with your ancestors. Let me take you back to the story or the history of the transatlantic slave trade that happened here in Ghana. Back then, during the Gold Coast era, Ghana had close to seven to ten empires we have the ashantis the bonos the hunters the dentra people the Ahuemu people and several <coughs> others these empires had to be fighting among themselves to expand their territories and due to that fact gold coast stretched to part of togo burkina faso mali ivory coast and several other neighboring countries the europeans arrived here in, during the era of the during the 14th century in the year 1482, they established their fortress. So they decided to utilize what we were practicing as a way of getting their form of slavery to us. So they supplied our elders or our traditional leaders with weapons so that they would go out there and fight their wars. They turned families against families, tribes against tribes, and that was how they managed to get their captives. They turned them all against each other, so they were fighting among themselves. And because they created allies with most of these people, they get to go into the interior for themselves. Yes, please. They go into the interior for themselves, then they were able to get people. They went all the way to the Ashanti Kingdom, the Bono Kingdom, and all the several places that had history with slavery. <coughs> Children at the age of 13 and above were picked. Pregnant women, men in chains and shackles, almost naked and barefooted, they had to walk for several miles to get to the Salaga slave market. According to one historian here in Ghana, Professor Akosia Adoma Pebi, in her book entitled History of the Indigenous Slavery of Ghana from the 15th century to the 19th century, she made mention and also provided a map in that book that 
out of all the slave markets we have here in Africa, Gold Coast alone had close to 63 of those slave markets. We have Salaga slave market, Pikoro slave market, Jenani, Ketekrache, Bonomanso. Kumasi actually happens to be the central midpoint mm -hmm. of all the slave markets. Mm -hmm. And then you link them all to the Asemansu slave market. From here you get to the Cape Coast dungeon, Elmina dungeon, Fort Amsterdam, Fort Williams, all the way to the Christian's War Castle in Osu, just to mention but a few. There was once a British historian, W. E. Ward, who traveled during the era of the slave trade. In his travel journal entitled, The Short History of Gold Coast, he made mention that out of the slave market I've mentioned, two of them played a significant role. The Asemansu here and that of the Salaga slave market in the northern interior of Ghana. He further on explained to us that for our ancestors in the chains and shackles to walk from there to get to this place, they had to cover over 300 miles. Today, if you should go in your vehicles, it will take you close to 16, 17 hours to get there on this machine. Our ancestors had to walk in chains, almost naked, barefooted, receiving whips to cover the journey and they took over 70 days, close to three months to make it to this point. When coming, they went through the Mole National Park, a nature reserve full of wild animals. For our ancestors to walk freely through that park, most of them were being used as bait. Their captives had to look among them in the chains and shackles. The weaker captives were taken off, walked for a safer distance, and they had them tied to trees. They went ahead to give them multiple whips. The blood that oozed out of them attracted the wild animals to where they were. And while the animals were feeding on them, the rest were moved out of the park. They succeeded, but we lost lives. On the journey, they met a particular river called the Pra River. It was a huge river. Mostly our ancestors coming from the hinterlands were not exposed to fast flowing rivers or huge ones like the Pra. They got there and the men who were able, strong enough to cross the river had to help their brothers and sisters out by carrying them on their shoulders to swim across the river. Doing that got so many of them weaker and they drowned there. All those who drowned were buried just at the bank of the river. Getting here was a tough decision. Headache one on most of, especially the women. Our mothers were only covered with animal skins. Mm -hmm. And those who have come of age, 70 days means you have to go through your cycles at least twice. Mm -hmm. Also, blood mm -hmm. flowing on them, their hands were tied. Mm -hmm. They couldn't take care of themselves. Insects are drawn to blood, wild animals are drawn to blood. Anytime they are about to approach these periods, they start to cry. Why? Because they know exactly what is going to happen to them. Because of that, the captors were shutting them up with two different treatments. The stone treatment and the metal mask treatment. The stone treatment was done in a way that they looked for stones a little bit wider than their mouths, force it in there and then had it tied around their necks. Or they first bunch of leaves into their mouth and then cover it up with the metal mask. That way, you can just shed your tears, but no one hears your voice. Hmm. Aside the rape and all other things given to them, they had to be subjected to this as well. Mm -hmm. Getting here, they arrived totally exhausted, hungry, and very dirty. At a same answer, so they saw the need for them to be fed. But here lies the case. Our ancestors were never fed here because they were hungry. They were fed because after covering the 70 days journey to this place, a lot of them have grown lean and they needed to toughen them up so that the buyers who come there here and find them more attractive and when they are priced, there wouldn't be much of a bad game. That was their main idea for feeding them here. After all that was done, they look among them in the chains and shackles. All the men who had their hair bushy and their beards bushy were taken down with a broken bottle. After doing that to them, you will see them all in blood. After that was done, they sorted them out according to age and gender. Mostly, they separated the children together with the women 
away from the men with a sense that the women will keep the children very calm. After that was done, then they went ahead to release their arms so that they could just raise it, allow some circulation of blood through the body so that they will build up quicker. After that, that was when they walked them to the river. But before we head to, to the river, we'll be talking about the graves we have here. Super under the rug. Here we have the tomb of Madame Crystal from Kingston, Jamaica. The middle one is Mr. Sam Walker from New York City, United States. And the last one came back from Barbados just recently, two years ago. Crystal was a former slave. She was captured from Ghana all the way to Jamaica. She was working on the British plantation. But because of the treatment, the rape, the more treatment given to them, she just wanted to embark on a hunger strike and die. But back then, for you to starve yourself to death, you had to do it in secret for no one to see you. But once you are caught in the act, they will force you to eat. So Krista was eventually caught up in the act and they had to force her to eat. The first uh, feeding treatment given to her was the chisel and hammer method. Because she refuses to open her jaw, they will have to do away with the front row of her teeth. They put a funnel in there, dish the food into the funnel with the help of water, they pushed it down her throat. That way, Krista stayed alive for them not to lose their money. But she didn't stop there. She's an African after all. Because she has already made up her mind. She waits until they have all left the place. Then she puts her hands right there in the throat and brings the, everything out. She eventually died in the process and according to oral history, by the ones who brought her back home, her dying wish was that any time slave trade and slavery comes to an end, they should bring back her bones to be buried here on the land for her soul to finally find peace. In 1998, that was when Christa's decision or um, wishes were realized. <coughs> she was brought together with Samuel Carson from the United States. Samuel happened to be the first African American to rose to the highest rank in the Navy, the Admiral position. He died and he wasn't given a befitting burial. For that reason, they saw the need for him to be brought together with Crystal back home so that their souls will connect with the spirit of the land and find peace. But before I go on talking about their coming, I will take you back a little bit. We all know that slave trade was abolished in Britain in the year 1804, effectively 1807. But the United States, it took them close to 60 years for them to do that. Our African families have been moving through the oceans to several places. So many of them happened to gain their freedom, I mean those in the Caribbean, for a very long time. So they, cele they celebrated the year um, emancipation celebration. None of the African <coughs> nations knew about that. It was in 1994. When the then president of Ghana, the late president, Jerry John Rawlings, traveled from here all the way to Jamaica, he got there and there was a celebration going on. And you know this man, he's a military man, so he's very curious whenever he met these things. So he decided to find out what it was all about. He was told that this is a celebration for the African families who gained their freedom out there. Then he sat and he thought that <laughs> this is interesting. Africans needed to celebrate mm. this. So when he arrived home, the very first thing he did was to put up the board of uh, directors and then some people come together, think about the best thing to do. So they came here as well and decided that this is the right spot. This is the right place for them to be celebrating their celebration. So in that year, they plan everything until 1998, the very first ever emancipation celebration in Panafest saw the return of Crystal and Samuel Castle. 
they will all flew back into this land mm -hmm. moved by road from the airport until they got your community by the road called Anomabo right there is a slave fortress <laughs> so the town is also known for each room it, it played back then in the days so the youths are aware of all these histories so they blocked the road, denying the ancestors' access via roads. They told the elders that there is no way they are going to allow them to be transporting their ancestors via roads to the destination they are taking them to. With reason being that they never left here via roads, they never flew out, uh, out of this continent. They went through a particular channel, and that was through the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So they went ahead to give them their fishing boats for them to transport their remains mm. through the oceans mm. to the castle. Mm. They went through the ocean to get to the castle. Cape Coast Castle has a very door, one called the door of no return. Mm. That door, I actually, I always say it's a lock. Mm. The name actually is a lock. Mm. No return. Mm. Once you go through it, you are never coming back home. And once our ancestors went through it, none of them have been back home. But these two went from behind, opened the door from behind and then entered the castle. And today as we speak, that part of the door is called Door of Return. Mm -hmm. Personally, I am being forced by my inner self to be calling them the gatekeepers. Because ever since they've been here, ever since they went through that door. Mm -hmm. It's as if a door has been opened or a channel has been created between us here in Africa and those in the diaspora. They were brought here on the 31st of July, 1998. And that day, that faithful 1st of August, which happened to be the first ever Emancipation Day celebration, these two were re-entered into this earth for their souls to connect with the spirit of their own land to find peace and go out there to bring back their brothers and sisters. 2019, 400 years of African resilience, we decided to celebrate it in grand style, the year of return. Let all African descendants, let all Africans, let all black people out there who believe they are Africans come back home. Well, Peter Tosh will always tell, uh, tell us that don't matter where you are, but as long as you are a black person, you are African. Yeah, yeah, right. But still, some people are deliberating on that. Some people are still in a dilemma. So we want them to know that Ghana or Africa is still their home, regardless of their belief or their uh, stand. So 19, 2019 happens to be the year of return. We were welcoming a lot of our brothers and sisters. The Prime Minister of Barbados, Her Excellency Mia Amo Motley, decided to come back home. Her journey was made a memorable one. Because she didn't come here alone. She came with a casket full of her ancestors. Mm. Mm. She went to the ancestral graveyard where most of them were buried, assumed their bones, and had it flown with her into this country. Beautiful to be buried here alongside Crystal and Samuel. So the last one, the one that we are, uh, we are yet to unveil, happened to be the remains of our ancestors who were brought back from Barbados. She couldn't sleep when she heard the message. She wanted to make it a memorable one, and then, yes, she did. She's yet to come back home to perform the unveiling ceremony. And we are hoping that the subsequent years to come, if not for the COVID and other things, yes, you should have been here. Today they are now a free nation. So they can choose to do whatever they want to do. We are free from the British, and yeah. we are here to assist them any way they can. 11th of November 2019, that particular last grave of tomb was created. That's because we had our ancestors buried in there. They are now home and they are now fulfilling their hopes or their hopes have been fulfilled. Their message to us is that we could also bring back our ancestors. It doesn't matter. We don't have to bring their bones. 
we might have something of value that belongs to them. Just have it flown into this country. Anywhere on this land, or anywhere at all in Ghana or in Africa, you want to have it buried. Just bury it there. And they will follow that and come back home to rest in perfect peace. Mm -hmm. Or the ashes. Yes. When you come with it, you go to the river mm -hmm. and then let them fly, let them free. That is something we wish to be doing right here. So, as you are all come back here to Asim and so, let me tell you about the pictures on these walls. George Ekin Ferguson, Malcolm X, Queen Nanny of the Maroon in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Then we have George Padmore, Booker T. Washington, Harriet Tubman, a.k.a. the Black Moses, mm -hmm. our very own Dr. Osage Fokwam Nkrumah, the liberator of Africa, if I'm allowed to say that. Then we have Anna Julia Copper, Sojourner Truth, Martin Luther King Jr., Frederick Douglass, Emmanuel, a.k.a. the Whip Peter, W.B. Dubois, Marcos Mezer Garvey Jr., and finally we have one person called Captain Bruce from Suriname. These are people we call our emancipators or freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. Several of us wouldn't have heard about Africa if not for them. Malcolm X was assassinated. So did most of them. I think Luther King and some others were also killed because they wanted to put the black race there at the rightful place. But because these people knew exactly what is in us, they didn't want to get us there. So they killed them so that we wouldn't. But now, you know something? The youth of today, we are more vibrant. It's as if the energy or the spirit that our ancestors had then is now reappearing in us. And we are also going to use that energy to get us where we needed to be. So please, let's all walk towards this direction so that we can 